Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kate Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. Wonderful to be back, Owen. Very, very wonderful because we have a special guest in the studio, in the flesh, which is always lovely. Mike Camp, how are you going? Very good. Very good. Thanks for asking me along. Yeah, it's. Um, we're just talking off air about a few different things, but for me at least, and I'd say maybe I speak on behalf of both of us, we're very, very humbled to have you with us in the studio today because you bring so much wisdom and vesting about behavior, about knowing yourself and just how that interacts with money in general. And you're also a student of history, which unfortunately is rarer than we would like. So you can recall things from 100 years ago, 200 years ago, maybe even longer. 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 (laughs) I'm I'm sure we will uh, get a taste of that. But let's set the scene. You've written a new book, your third, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. But we want to dive into kind of every facet of not just the book, but also your career in, you've had two distinct careers, if you will. Can you just go back in time, Mike, and tell us where did your interaction with money come from or investing? Well, I think you're born with, essentially born with the desire. Um, So there's that, that part of things. But at age four, when I was four, uh, my parents split up and my father left the house and left my mother with four children uh, in a very nice suburb, in a very nice home, but my we didn't have any money. Hmm. So it was a rather unusual situation, I guess. Um, my mother got a job when I was five and effectively I was on my own after that. She used to come home from work every day. She had a full-time job. But uh, I had to become very independent. Uh, For example, I remember at age eight, I uh, wanted a new bicycle. She couldn't afford one. I entered a colouring competition and (laughs) I won a new Malvern Star. Uh, Age 11, I remember I started a job because I wanted some money and my mother couldn't give me pocket money. So I got a job as a paper boy um, six days a week, starting at 6 a.m. So I used to deliver papers before I went to school. And that's probably age 11 when I first realized that I had an interest in money because I saved a lot of money from my paper round and I bought a corporate debenture. And what, I mean, when you look back on it, I thought it was normal, but when you look back on it, what 11 year old buys a corporate debenture? Corporate debenture is essentially a when a company needs money and it borrows it. So it pays you a high rate of interest. It's, it's like a, a mini term deposit, but directly lending money to the company. Of course, I, at age 11, I didn't realize what I should have done as a credit analysis on the, on the company. <laughs> I didn't, probably didn't know much the difference between a bank and a company. But um, So that was age 11, but I didn't really get serious about investing in stocks until I was in my 20s because you need money. And of course, as a teenager and so forth, um, so I got very serious at age 11, but I always knew I had an interest in finance. Um, apparently at age six, I told my mother I wanted to become a bank manager when I was older. <laughs> very I mean, specific. I mean, what, what six-year-old wants to be a bank manager? You know, normally it's, you know, drive a fire engine or fly a plane or something. So <laughs> mm. it, it was sort of there. Uh, I had a fascination with mathematics. I loved mathematics. So it was just a natural, natural fit. Can I ask a follow-up here? When I heard this story first time around, I was really intrigued by this because knowing what you went on to do after this, which we'll get to in a minute, we talk about on the show limiting money beliefs and people's relationship with money and how that can actually have adverse consequences from the, the, like chi- being a child and seeing parents with money going through things like 
breakdowns in relationships, not having money, having too much. These all have consequences, at least it seems. Mm -hmm. Did did you find like did you did you find maybe later in your life, which we can get to in a minute, that that like your father leaving have consequences on your relationship with money? Absolutely. Did that lead you to overcompensate in any way? Maybe I I, I saw my mother necessarily eke every cent of value out of a dollar. Mm. Every cent of value was important, and I guess. Even to this day, even though I, I now I don't need to do it, unless something has value, I, I, I lose interest. You know, I, I don't want to overpay for things. Mm. And, and you can't, that never leaves you, never leaves you. For example, when I travel on a plane, I fly economy domestically because I can't see the point of traveling business. The seat's mm. a couple of inches wider and the flight's only for an hour and a half. What's the point? Uh, but I would consider it now at my age <laughs> for international flights. Yep. So uh, that's just an example. Mm. Um, I hate throwing money away mm. is what I'm trying to say. Mm. Fair enough. And did this independence as a child, was that what you think led you to investing in shares early on? Because yeah. still a lot of us don't start in our 20s. Yeah, I had an interest in the share market and I was working at Bankers Trust at the time. So I... I you know, it was interesting how I chose corporate finance. I had been a general dentist for a short period of time and I knew I didn't like it, so I did an MBA at Monash and I wasn't really sure what corporate finance was and I went <laughs> to the class and at the end of the class, after a few, well, under a few classes, I walked up to the lecturer and I said, is there a job <laughs> that does what you're teaching us? And he said, Sure. Go and work for a broker or an investment house in, in the corporate finance department. He said, it's exactly what I'm teaching you. So then I knew what I wanted to do. Mm. And I, I got a job at Bankers Trust and I also had a, ended up with a job at Potter Warburg in their corporate finance department. And I was I used to pinch myself each day saying, really? Is this work? <laughs> no, I just loved it. Yeah. What didn't, what didn't you like about being a dentist? That's a really hard question. Um, as a general dentist, I used to go to lectures from specialists, specialist dentists, and I used to sit there and I used to say, why does this person know more about dentistry than me? So I, I didn't like the generality of it. I didn't feel that it was exploring the intellectual side of, of what one can pursue, mm. whereas finance offered much more intellectual interaction. It wasn't to me about making money. It was about the intellectual side of things that I, I loved about finance. Because mm. there's so many facets to it mm. that people don't think about. A lot of people enter finance because they think, I just want to make a lot of money. No, it's about psychology. It's about history. It's about accounting. It's about every facet of life that you can think about to become a good investor. Mm. So many other avenues to explore. Mm. So you chose shares predominantly, it seems, yeah. over other types of finance, like a corporate finance, I don't know, worker can move into different parts of corporate finance. They can move yeah. into debt. They can move yeah. into private markets. Yeah. Why did you end up in shares? Yeah, my first, I, when I went looking for a job, Macquarie Bank offered me a job. I sort of got excited about that. And I said, what department will I start off in? They said, the property department. I went, ugh. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, what is it about shares? Um, if, I, if you look at the different asset classes, what's important me, to me is to make income or have a, an asset that delivers income, I should say, and make capital gain as well. So I like asset classes that deliver both. You look at something like gold, it, it doesn't deliver income. Mm. I've never seen a chunk of gold deliver any income. Um, it, its price swings around a lot. You look at bonds, sure they deliver an income, but the capital gain is sort of missing unless it's in a falling interest rate environment. Mm. So you're taking a punt on where interest rates are heading. Uh, so bonds and gold, no, no. So you sort of got property and shares. Property, no. Um, for me, it's an absolute hassle owning property. I'm, I know you can go through a REIT or whatever, but direct property, no because it's difficult to find one. You have to go on the search. 
Then you have to pay massive amounts of stamp duty, what, 5.5% in Victoria. We're, we're taxed to the hilt in Victoria for obvious reasons. We're broke. Um, <laughs> you get taxed while you own it, and land tax has just gone up in Australia. Uh, there's the hassles. Of course, you can get a, a prep property manager, but that costs. And then when you sell it, you've got to pay uh, a, a fee to the real estate agent, assuming you sell it. I'm, I'm trying to sell three properties I've got at the moment, and God help me, I'm in the three offices. The office market has died uh, in Australia, mm. probably across the world. So I, I just find property a hassle. Um, I do own some REITs. They're, they're much more kind to me. Uh, so shares, it's, it's someone else's managing. You know, you can make the buy and sell decision and activate that buy and sell decision sitting at your desk at home. It's just so convenient. The money gets paid into your bank account. You can be anywhere in the world and just pull the cash out of your bank account. Right? So shares interest me. They're multifaceted. I love the psychology behind the share market, uh, how it behaves, understanding how it behaves. Mm. So it's been an easy one for me. Mm. Mm. And speaking of behaviour, you've spent the last couple of years working on your latest book, The Ulysses Contract, and I think the biggest question people probably have when they see the front cover of the book is, what is the Ulysses contract? Why did you choose that title and what's the story there? So I'd love if you could explain a bit of the yeah, background. Yeah, I came across the term a few years ago and I thought, what a great you know, name for behaviour in the share market because, I mean, it, it, it's borrowed from Homer's ancient poem and one of the central char characters is a guy called Odysseus um, or in Latin, Ulysses is more commonly known as Ulysses, he's the king of Ithaca and he's sailing home uh, with his crew uh, after the Trojan Wars. And he's sailing past an island that uh, uh, sirens inhabit, which are beautiful, sweet singing sirens that lure sea uh, seafarers onto the rocks to their ultimate death. And to sail safely past this island, he told his crew to put wax in their ears but he wanted to hear this song, so he asked them to rope him to the mast, minus the wax. So what Ulysses was doing was putting in place a plan before he got exposed to temptation to stop himself from doing anything stupid. And I thought, what an appropriate term for investing, because investing also is a journey. You're going to be exposed to a lot of sirens, Mm. Um, and they will take you away from the path of good investing behaviour and onto the rocks of financial destruction. So that it, that's what that's why I called it that. It, it's basically a book about what to avoid um, when you start your investing journey or on your way through your investing journey. Um, all the blind alleys you can go down and the mistakes you can make and why you should avoid them because some of them aren't very obvious, and many of them are very alluring, mm. Mm. particularly when money's involved. Mm. What do you think are some of the ones, that those sirens, that don't seem obvious from the outset? Uh, well, I think, I think Ben Graham said it uh, in 1949 in his first edition of The Intelligent Investor. He said, uh, the first one is yourself. Um, the investor's chief, and Graham said the investor's chief problem and perhaps his worst enemy uh, is himself. Uh, we are extremely irrational. We have a lot of human frailties. And the problem is we always think that we're right. So we can do stupid things and think stupid things uh, and believe that we're right. So I guess the first one is ourselves. And that's why I would encourage people to read uh, books on uh, behavioural books uh, about what we tend as humans to do things, how we do things wrong, you know, things like bias and um, believing things that aren't so, uh, taking shortcuts, um, greed, uh, emotion. Uh, because when we're emotional, uh, fear and greed, we can't think straight. Uh, which is really, really bad for an investor. I think the irrational behaviour that 
humans carry on with all the time. Uh, it works against good investing. Um, the book is available at Big W. It's available on Booktopia. Pretty much everywhere. Pretty much everywhere. The Ulysses contract, you can pick it up. Um, yep. Sold out pretty quick of the first run. The first run, um, Which is it was basically impressive. the first day. Uh, the first day it came out and uh, it looks like we're going to go on to the third print run, yeah. Who, when you had this book in mind, so just quickly, the idea of like avoiding temptation and having a plan and these types of things, who did you have in mind would pick up this book and read it? I think the earlier the better. I mean, I would, I would love, I would love a 20 or 30 year old to read it. Mm. Um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of 20 and 30 year olds have fairly fixed views about investing and they don't necessarily like listening to these sorts of things. Often, I often find young people want to make money quickly and that's not the message of the book. Um, they want to be told what works. They don't want to be told what doesn't work. Um, mm. but, but that's not the message. The message that drove my book is, is I guess, something that a German writer, philosopher, satirist called... Um, uh, Ludwig Born said 200 years ago, he said, losing an illusion makes you wiser than finding a truth. And I believe that if you get the illusions out of investing, all the things that don't work, and then focus on the things that do work, uh, you've got a much better chance of success. Who else though? Uh, anyone of any age, really, anyone yeah. who's still investing, anyone who's still got a pulse, um, you know, people who are 60, 70 may still have 20 or 30 years of investing left. So I don't think there's any specific age. Mm. No, it's great. Um, I, I'm 32. Kate, I won't say her name, but Kate's a bit younger than me. Yeah. Um, and some of the best piece of advice, I look back on it now with hindsight, I think I should have paid so much more attention were the ideas around avoiding mistakes rather than achieving success, like the old Charlie Mung adage of, like, avoid stupidity, don't seek brilliance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, I digress. What are some of the sirens? Can you give us an example or examples that people should be aware of? And I think it illustrates the concept beautifully. I think a pervasive one is the crowd. We are social animals. Uh, we don't think it. We sort of tend to separate ourselves from the animal kingdom, but you should not. I mean, why when someone cries fire do you start running for the exit before checking whether in fact there is a fire? Uh, we take our cue from the behaviour of the crowd. And I think if the crowd is doing something, if the crowd is piling into a stock, we see safety. If the crowd is selling a stock or selling the market, we see safety even though it's a stupid thing to do. If you want a specific example, I think an absolutely beautiful example um, was the crash in October 1987. It was a Tuesday in Melbourne. Uh, I remember waking up that morning and I uh, was listening to the news and Wall Street had just closed down 23%. Now, is there any reason for Australia to have fallen by 25% that day, which it did? No one was asking any questions. They were just behaving as Wall Street did. We were running for the exits because someone called fire. Uh, I think a really interesting thing is they had six investigations into the crash, the October crash, in the subsequent four months after it to try and find out the reason why the market fell 23% in, in mm. America. And they didn't come up with a conclusive reason. Not, not one conclusive reason. And uh, a guy called Bob Schiller, uh, you've probably heard of him. He wrote the book Irrational Exuberance. Bob Schiller sent out a questionnaire to many people, uh, qualified, experienced, financial people in America and said, why did you sell? Uh, and the answer came back. They just said, because the market was falling. Mm. Yeah, so that was the most dominant reason. So we take our cues from the crowd and you've got to think Socratically. Uh, I remember during dot-com when everyone was buying dot-com stocks 
and Warren Buffett wasn't for obvious reasons. He didn't believe in buying uh, companies that were just burning cash like that. And he was getting heavily criticised in the press at a personal level. You know, what's wrong, Buffett? Buffett? You know, buffeted by the winds of change. We even carried these articles in the Australian Financial Review. He copped an absolute, you know, pounding by the press. But who, who had the last laugh, really? He was thinking Socratically. He was saying, this doesn't register with me. Mm. But a lot of people bought got dot-com stocks because they saw them ripping up in value. So the crowd can be a very, very, uh, very, very seductive siren. On the way up and on the way down. And on the way down. Well, I think forecasters, you know, economic forecasters can be a very seductive siren. Um, they're basically fortune tellers. They don't know. They just appear to know. They speak very, very confidently. Uh, the, the, the problem is that we, none of us know what the future holds. We can have a guess, but none of us know. But we hate that. I mean, Alfred Coles, back in 1930, uh, American Alfred Coles, basically said the reason that we list, listen to forecasters, even though we shouldn't, because is because a world in which one no one knows can be frightening. Humans hate a void. And the future is a void. So what they are prepared to do is to listen to forecasters, economic forecasters, who are telling them how things are going to turn out. But the thing that worries me about forecasters is that they deliver that forecast as a narrative. In other words, they, they and it starts to sound like fact. The past is a narrative because it happened. It's fact. The past can be delivered as a story. And when they start delivering the future in the same sort of expressive way, th the difference between past, which is fact, and future, which is not fact, starts to become blurred and people start to believe them. Uh, I think a really interesting thing that denies this, a guy called Philip Tetlock, uh, he's a professor at Philadelphia University, in the US. He's an expert on experts. He does research into these expert predictions. And probably one of his most interesting study, he looked at the forecasts of, I think it was about 250, 260 economic and political forecasters. But he did something we don't do. He followed the forecast through time to see if that came true. And altogether, they produced 27,500 forecasts and in Tetlock's words, the outcome of their forecast could have been achieved by a chimpanzee throwing darts at a dartboard. But the really interesting thing I found was that the subgroup of forecasters that performed the worst were the most confident ones. And as I like to say, where do we find confident forecasters? On the news, mm -hmm. in the newspapers. They get presented by the bank or the mm. financial institution as their face because people love confidence and it's dangerous to listen to forecasters. Well, it's certainly dangerous to act on what they're saying. You don't need to. So that's another one. This whole, this whole idea of um, top-down investing where you, you think about the economy and what that's going to do then you think about the business sector that's going to perform the best within your economic forecast and then the businesses that are best. I just laugh. The whole thing is on the, on the, on the premise that your first basis for choosing was correct <laughs> and it's not. So it's faulted from the beginning. Um, but I, I think from memory I've got about 11 or 12 uh, sirens that I talk about. So there's, there's a few. I don't know if you want me to talk about any others. What about this? Does um, market timing work? So things like, you know, patterns, trading, these types of things, a lot of people get lured in by this. Yeah, you've talked about two things there. You've talked about market timing and you've talked about charting. Um, I'd like, <laughs> in most people's hands, market timing doesn't work. In most people's hands. Mm. Uh but everyone, see, it's this whole thing of people getting confused between the past, the present, and the future. 
And lots of people will look at the past events and say, well, that was obvious. You hear from very, very few people before a crash, but you'll hear from a lot of people after a crash that they knew it was coming, but, mm. but they were quiet. Does market timing work? The only time I think I can actually make any sense of it all is in the wake of a crash. Uh, there's been about four boom markets and crashes in my investing career. The only one that I felt moderately comfortable that I picked before it happened was dot-com because it was just so stupid. Uh, but 87, I didn't pick it. 2008, I didn't pick it. I didn't know that was coming. Of course, March 2020 in that sort of flash crash and up, you know, the COVID-induced flash, flash drop, I, I didn't know that was coming. So in terms of pre-crash, dot-com was the only one I sort of had an inkling about. Uh, I didn't get caught up in all of that. In terms of market bottoms, I start to get pretty excited when stocks are offered really, really cheaply. If you call that picking the turn of a market, I, 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 I can't say I know when the bottom is there, but I remember how excited I was about buying bank stocks in early 2009, uh, just because they were so cheap. So I think market drops deliver opportunity. Um, predicting exact turns, no, I can't do that. And I don't really think anyone can. Mm. Some people are hopeless full stop. They get so caught up in the exuberance, they don't see a crash coming. And then they get so caught up in the pessimism in the wake of a crash, they'd never buy again. Mm. So this all gets back to, to emotion. Mm. And the other one uh, was charting. And charting. I only bring this up because I've heard you talk about it before. Yeah, charting, the old fashioned charting. Uh, I, I'm not an advocate. Um, what I think charting is all about is that humans have long relied on patterns. We love patterns. You know, we, we see man on the moon. Um, we see, you know, images in the stars, lines drawn together. Uh, historically, uh, mankind has looked out to the horizon and seen the patterns in the sky to get a feel for what, what the weather's going to be. We, we love, we're pattern seeking animals. Um, I tell the story in my book of during World War II uh, when the V1 and V2 rockets were, were raining down on London. They were being sent from the French coast by the Germans. My mother lived through that, by the way. Um, she was in London right through the Second World War. And what the Londoners saw that was that the East End was getting hit more by rockets, uh, V1s and V2s, than any other part of London. So they assumed that the Germans were targeting in the East End. Uh, but what they didn't know is the German technology wasn't that accurate. They had about a, about a 30 mile radius they could, the things were landing in. So this was just a pattern that was being drawn by randomness. Uh, they found out after the war that was the case. So people tend to read things into things when there is no meaning there. I think the classic one is a study that was undertaken by an American called Holbrook. Um, Holbrook working and he was trying to work out if charting actually works so what he did was he generated some random charts absolutely random random numbers and then drew a chart so it was nonsense <laughs> and he handed them to some uh, traders the financial markets and they sat down and interpreted it and told him what the price of whatever commodity it was supposed to be was going to do and that they were drawing sense out of nonsense and I think there's a real risk with charting to do that. I'm not denying that trading, there are successful traders out there, but they don't use charts anymore. Mm. They use computers. Mm. You've spoken a bit about these different sirens and how often we can be our own worst enemy, which is mm -hmm. quite a confronting thing to face, especially as a new investor when you don't know where to turn. I know that you've studied a lot of different areas and you've looked at history and psychology when you've been learning about investing if we're trying to think how to improve our own skills as investors, should we be looking, what discipline should we be looking at or what skills should we be trying to, to cultivate to improve our own 
skills as investor and not get trapped by these sirens? I think you mentioned the two most important ones, but there are other areas you can look at. I, I think financial history is absolutely essential. Mm. Uh, the first stock market started really essentially in uh, 1602 with uh, the Dutch East India Company. That was the first company that could be traded as a public share as we know them today. Uh, the shares were traded in an open outcry in Amsterdam at the, the dam, the, the square that's still there. And then they built a stock exchange which was opened in 1611 and then they had a specific place, the first purpose-built a stock exchange was in Amsterdam, opened 1611. Uh, so, you know, the US came much later, you know, 1790. So the Europeans were trading shares for a long, long time. But uh, the oldest book I've got on stock trading uh, is a book called Confusion Deconfusions, which was written by Joseph de la Vega. He used to trade on the Amsterdam exchange during the 1600s. And when he gets to his final chapter, and he, it was released in 1688, when he gets to his final chapter, there was a stock market crash in Amsterdam, in Holland. Hmm. And it's interesting to read because it's so similar to the crashes. Uh, so if you look back, and you look back at South Sea Bubble, 1720s, Mississippi scheme in France, same period of time, the similarities between the South Sea Bubble and dot com are unbelievable. Uh, I remember going through dot com and just drawing massive number of analogies between that and 1720. So what doesn't change, and I call it a, the human constant, what does not change is human behaviour. So I like to think that by reading history, when you come to another big financial event or crash, I say, it's like seeing a movie for the first time, but you know exactly how it's going to end. So that's that's what I, what I get out of financial history, psychology, um, behavioural finance. Yes, very much so, because you start to understand yourself. And there's two very important things with um, behavioural finance. Not only do you understand how you could misbehave emotionally, but you start to understand how the market can misbehave emotionally. And that becomes a much greater key and an insight into interpreting what is going on. Mm. Because if you don't have that understanding, then it's just mass confusion. But there's order. There's order amongst all of that. Now, you, other things that you can read, if you want to be a stock picker, and you don't have to be a stock picker to be a good investor. You could buy, you know, index funds, uh, ETFs. You don't have to be a stock picker. Um, but if you want to be a stock picker and choose individual stocks, it's a lot more work. You have to understand accounting. There is no choice. It's the language of business. And you have to be able to speak the language. So you have to understand accounting. You have to understand the sectors in which the companies that you are investing operate. There is no use buying Coles or Woolies because you think it's better than some other company unless you understand retailing. You really need to dig down. Um, I've spent, uh, I've been to uh, Omaha, Nebraska three times, uh, sorry, five times actually, five times. Um, and I've been had the opportunity to listen to a lot of uh, um, managers, CEOs of Berkshire Hathaway companies talk about about Warren Buffett. Now, what they say about him is almost with a unified voice. He is so understanding of our business that I would feel confident that he could step in as CEO. You may remember when there was that crisis at Solomon Brothers. I think it was you know twenty five odd years ago. I can't give you the exact date. Uh, when Solomon Brothers had a scandal, it was a, a bond trading scandal, and Buffett stepped in as chairman. He knew the banking business well enough to be able to step in. And I ask investors who are stock pickers, this is the test. Do you understand that business well enough that you could run it? Because if you don't, you're not really as good a stock picker as what Warren Buffett is. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Um, in answering a question, what can you read? I honestly believe, as he does, you should be reading trade journals. You should be getting an understanding. If you if you want to buy a mining company, you have to understand how mining companies operate. Mm. Uh, if you want to buy retail businesses, you have to understand how retail operates. But as I said, you don't have to dig down that deep if mm. you choose not to, to be an investor. Mm. Um, I take a lot of comfort in studying history in moments of weakness in the market because it reminds you that you've been here before, or we've been here before. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done that a lot recently. I found myself going further and further back in time and looking through things. Um, in a previous conversation you had with Phil Muscatello from Shares for Beginners, you mentioned, he asked you a question around has nothing changed or something to that effect, you know, is there's nothing new under the sun, so to speak. And you mentioned that you had something framed on your wall from the British Parliament in, I'm going to say, 17, maybe it was 17 something. Oh, is this a John Barnard Act? I think so, yes. It yeah, was, yes. it's not framed on my wall. I've actually got the act. I've got it bound. Yeah. Yeah. Can you yeah, tell us about it, well, this? Well, it's interesting. I remember, uh, I think it was in the 70s, they, they, if you, if you look up Wikipedia, I think it'll tell you that, for example, contracts for difference. CFDs, yeah. Yeah, were invented uh, in England in 17, sorry, in 1976 or 1977, some, sometime in the 70s, and everyone jumped on the whole CFD thing. But if you look at Sir John Barnard's Act, um, I think it was 1736. It was certainly in the wake of the uh, South Sea Bubble of 1720. Um, they enacted in Parliament uh, an act to protect people from leveraged investments. And options were specifically mentioned. Um, CFDs, contract for differences, they called them, were specifically mentioned to, to be banned. So we think, we think that we are sophisticated today in our instruments. I mean, if you look back, uh, I talked before uh, about the stock market six, starting in 1602, with the Dutch East India Company. Right from the start, there were options. You could trade options on those shares. So a lot of the things that we think are new and weird and wonderful uh, aren't necessarily new and weird and wonderful. I mean, you look at uh, Tiber Tiberius, one of the emperors of Rome. You know, we're going back 2,000 years. Uh, Rome had a, uh, a problem with its economy at the time, uh, as we do now. So you know what he did? He flooded Rome with money. Flooded it with money. It's effect effectively uh, what they did with TARP over in the US in the wake of the mm. GFC. You know, so these tools, there's nothing new and wonderful about what we're doing now. I think we're doing the same things. We're just doing them quicker. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot to be said for the role computers are playing in the whole Absolutely. world of investing. And one of the, the questions that uh, a friend asked me was, how long will it take for computers to just take over investing completely and we don't need to be involved at all? I think it's just time. I think it's almost inevitable. I mean, you look at computers, they've effectively taken over trading. You look at high-frequency trading, computer-driven. You look at Jim Simons and Renaissance Technologies. Jim Simons is probably the most successful, you know, he would be the most successful trader of all time. He's a mathematician. He, he set up Renaissance Technologies. He, he, he left his career as a mathematician when he was 40 years old. He's well into his 80s now. I think he's 85. So he set up Renaissance Technologies and employed people who knew nothing about investing, nothing about finance, but everything about trying to find pricing inefficiencies using computers. And Renaissance Technologies has been hugely successful in trading. Uh, they make, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of tra trades in a day. So computers have taken over trading. There's no doubt about that. That's why I say that, you know, using a chart is like entering the Grand Prix with a Model T Ford. Uh, <laughs> they have not yet taken over investing per se. I think that's at a higher level in terms of stock picking. But the, the beauty about, I think we need artificial intelligence to develop further for that. The beauty about computers is they kill two of, or take away two of the biggest problems that the human brain has. Um, number one, emotion. 
You know, you can produce a computer that's totally emotionless, even though 60 Minutes carried an article last Sunday night and they were saying that they're going to produce computers that have emotion. You don't really don't want that in investing. So they get rid of that human emotional facet. Uh, and the other one that computers are much better at humans at is the way they think. We think in a linear way. Uh, we process information in a linear way because our, our brain's a bit simplistic. For example, you know, when there is inflation, you crank up interest rates, bang. It's far more complex beast than that. What you really need and what the human brain can't do is interactive thinking. It's when A affects B, but only if C is affecting D and only if F is half of what Y was. And then when you change one thing, everything readjusts. And there are thousands of things that impact on a result. That's called interactive thinking. Now, a guy called Paul Slovic, who's a psychologist in the US, looked at how much uh, humans, how much um, analysts, how much investment analysts use interactive thinking in analyzing, in analyzing stocks. And he genu generously, generously said it's probably only about 4% of the time. So 96% of the time plus, they're just thinking in a linear way, which is not for good for investing. Now, computers will leave us in their wake with their ability to do interactive thinking. So I think what will happen, and again, remember this is all driven by money. What, 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 is a, what does a great investor need? A great investor needs to pick up price inefficiencies and then capitalize on that price inefficiency. What's going to happen when computers start seeking out price efficiency inefficiencies in, in stock values? Because we won't be doing it anymore. It'll be the job of the, the one, the winner will be the best computer. And what it's going to do is significantly improve price efficiency. They're going to do themselves out of a job of, of, of essentially because they're going to arbitrage out any price advantage that the other computer can find or this one can find. That as computers get better, the market will become more price efficient. I actually think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I think markets, to think that they will be price efficient is, is actually a wonderful thing. Um, but where we're heading, I mean, not, not even the experts of, of AI really know how it's all going to end up, do they? You know, half of them think it's a dangerous thing, half of them think it's a wonderful thing. But I think human brain will necessarily step aside, step aside one day. I just don't know when. I probably have a, a, a opposing view to that, and I'll happily pass it back to you, which is that um, for as long as human beings are the customers of businesses, human beings will have the advantage. And the reason I say that is human beings pay for the value. So we can use like multiple regressions and language models to predict with big data what people should do, but a lot of times people aren't rational so unless we can breed a rationality in the numbers, and where I'm going with this is, I fully agree about efficient markets, and I think a lot of the people that rely on models, um, so like quantitative investors, I think they'll just com be completely, because there is no edge in that if the computer is your nemesis. Um, but for example, I think that the behavioral edge that people get from investing is both an advantage and a disadvantage, as you say. And so... I agree with you in principle that it will have happen eventually, but I probably have a less, it by the sounds of it, I could be wrong, a less, my, my perspective is longer term. I think it will take a very long time. I think it will too, but I, I, when I am asked how long will markets be inefficient, I th my answer usually is as long as human beings are involved. So I guess that sort of plays into what you are also mm. saying. As long as human beings are involved in pricing in any way, markets will continue to be inefficient, which I think is effectively what you're saying. Mm. Do you think that uh, do you think that markets are already at a point where they're near this efficiency? Because the reason I bring this up, right, is we know that a lot of active fund managers, and there's a myriad of reasons for their doing mm -hmm. so poorly. So sorry, Kate, if we're Mike and I are boring you to death with this conversation, but um, 
I think there are a myriad of reasons why they underperform, which would take a whole other podcast to discuss. But we are at a point where so many of them do so poorly. Mm -hmm. We are. It's an interesting question. I, I, this one's been put to Warren Buffett um, at his AGMs, which he holds in the first September of May each year. Um, and he's basically admitted what you just said. He said when he started out investing, and he got serious about it in 1956 when mm. he started his partnership, and the first 13 years from 56 to 69, he he was delivering a geometric compound return of 30%. Mm. Incredible. And we hasn't since done that. But he was saying in the early days it was really important, really easy, he said, because what Ben Graham taught him at Columbia University – because he was a student of Ben Graham, and what he read in Security Analysis, which was published in 1934, he said it was useful information. He said that you know there wasn't the internet, there, there wasn't there wasn't you know as much said in in your reports. He said information was hard to get hold of, so anyone who was prepared to dig down hard had an advantage. Um, there weren't many people doing that sort of research, and. Uh, ben Graham himself, who died in 1976, just before he died, he was asked this question, the exact question you're raising. Now, this is 1976. And he said, what I wrote in security analysis is doesn't give the edge it used to because there are so many people doing it now that that is tending towards market efficiency. And even Ben Graham mm. said, what I used to do doesn't work anymore. Yet people still read security analysis as if it's going to give them an edge. I don't think it does anymore. Mm. Um, you know, Buffett hasn't been performing that well the last 15 years or so. I guess you could say it's size. Mm. And it's hard to perform that well when you've got a, over 100 billion in treasury notes. <laughs> you know, they're not it's delivering much money. interest. You know, then, so yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it is tending towards becoming more efficient, but there are times when it becomes massively inefficient and they are times of extreme, like mm. market crashes or euphoria. So it's more about human behaviour, not just your normal every day. I think, I think you know, 95% of the time the market is as efficient as you can get mm. and it just goes haywire and it'll continue to get haywire as, as long as humans are holding the steering wheel. Mm. You've mm. spoken about trying to really understand the company and understand it well enough to run it. What has been the most unusual source of an investing idea for you? I uh, Look, I haven't really had any super duper unusual source, you know, sources of investment. I, I think I think one I feel proud of <laughs> was uh, Collins Foods. I'm in the top 20 shareholders at Collins. Um and probably will be for some time. Uh, it was floated uh, in 2012, I think, late 2000. No, 2011 it was floated, two bucks fifty a share. And in 2011, the share price had dropped to a dollar. So that's when I got interested. I had a look at it, and its enterprise value, in other words, its its equity plus its net debt. Uh, and it had 119 KFCs, most of them in Queensland, a couple in New South Wales, I think. And I looked at its enterprise value, in other words, what you could buy it for, and the number of KFCs it owned. And I worked out you could actually buy the equivalent of a KFC uh, for about $1.5 million. And you got a Sizzler restaurant thrown in as well. Mm. And at the time, it cost more if you wanted to buy a KFC franchise and he had to go through the bother of going through a training school and organising staff and running that. I thought this is an absolute no-brainer. So I bought up big on Collins Foods and that's worked out enormously well. Um, it now spits out a dividend of about 27 cents a year on a $1 hmm. investment. So 27% it, yield. <laughs> yeah, div dividend yield. Remember, it retains earnings as well for yeah. capital growth. So that, that was good. And the other one, I'll say this very quickly, was um, a property. Am I allowed to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. That, 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 I, that investing idea? It's part of your finances. Yeah, I bought a property which turned out pretty well for, for, for the following reason. Um, 
it was selling off the plan and I realised it was being built on a coastal town, very, very popular holiday resort place in Victoria. And I knew that if I bought a certain unit, the view was going to be sensational. I mean, we are talking, you've got to go to Switzerland to get a better view. <laughs> right. Unbroken coastal view um, from Lawn Beach through to Anglesey and out into Bass Strait with nothing in front of you. It was just breathtaking. But they hadn't yet built it. So everyone was looking at the, the plan of the building and focusing on the building. I was just thinking about the view. <laughs> so I... I Fortunately, bought the unit I wanted, um, and I bought it for off the plan price, and then flipped it because I knew anyone who walked into that property after it was built, they'd go weak at the knees at the view. <laughs> so that was that was a great investing <laughs> idea as well, and we got right off stocks then. That's so you've you got to see you've got to see something that other people don't. I, I think in investing, mm. essentially, mm. yeah. Um, so it's interesting that you bring up Collins Foods, which uh, CKF is the ticker symbol on the ASX, which is obviously a play on KFC, which is chances are most of the people listening to this, unless you're a veggie or a vegan, you probably don't go there that often, yeah. um, which is fair. You can get the chips, I guess. It wasn't a stock recommendation no, either, no, no, by the way, all. Owen. It mm. wasn't a stock recommendation because it's a very different price now than when I bought it. Yeah, absolutely. But I wanted the reason why I use this as a segue is I often say one of the best ways to get rich is to use other people's money to do it. And a franchisee is like the perfect way to do it. Because if you own the brand, you can basically get people to pay you yes. for them to use your brand, which they then pay you for forever a percentage yeah. of sales. Yeah, yeah. And I'm curious what, if we just talk business models, so nothing on this show is a recommendation of any sort, but um, what business model stands out to you as something that is truly like beautiful or a business that you think, this is just special, what it's created or what it's done. I really like car sales. Oh, yeah. It has quite a moat. Um, but but I've got to add that uh, businesses are a good investment only if you buy them at the right price. Mm. You know, and a great business can be a shocking investment if you buy it to, at too high a price. So, well, I'm going to talk about car sales very quickly, but I'm not recommending it as a buy. It's up to you to work out how much you think it's worth. For sure. Um, but it was floated at three dollars fifty, I think, in two thousand and nine. Uh, it's now travelling at about twenty three bucks. So you know, a lot of that benefit's already been seen. But the thing I like about car sales is it's got a captured market in mm. many ways. It's got a moat around it. Um, if people want to buy a car, they go to car sales because it's big. If people want to sell a car, they go to car sales because it's big. And when you when you want to buy a car, you want to see. Lots of cars. Mm. You know, if you're buying a particular, you're buying a Mazda, whatever, you, a model, you want somewhere where there's going to be a lot of them. And when you sell a car, you want as many eyeballs to see it. So it's, 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 now things change because remember, the way you used to buy a car was in the age, Saturday morning classifieds. They used to mm. call the classifieds on Saturday morning ages River, River of Gold. Trading post. Yeah. yeah, well, the trading post was another one. Um, but the age you'd go to when I was first got a car, I went to the age, died overnight because of the internet. Mm. You know, Seek was produced and car sales was produced and Domain was produced. And so technology could, could kill it. Uh, but we haven't got much control over that, have we? Mm-hmm. No, um, uh, CSL is another one, I guess. You know, floated what thirty years ago um, for two bucks, whatever. Uh, but if you look at the price that the original shareholders bought it at on a share split basis, they paid seventy seven cents for it. When you, uh, mm. you know, just for share, just for share split, it's three hundred bucks now. What a great company that's been. But you know, I'm talking about this in hindsight, aren't I? Mm. You know, wonderful to talk about things. But that's a good way to reflect on history, right? Yeah. Is to look at the, to study the businesses, to see what they did that was so special and to develop that. Well, I think car sales, it just had a moat. Yeah. It had a moat. You've got to have a moat. You've got to defend yourself from your competitors, Mm. essentially. Mm. One of the things we look at as investors is who's actually running the company, the the management team and the CEO and the board. What do you, when you're looking at a company, are there any 
green flags, red flags that stand out to you when trying to decide do you like who's running the show? It's a really, really tough thing to assess CEOs. Uh, it's a tough, tough question. So I guess let's let's look at it a couple of different ways. I I have met many CEOs, but I haven't got to know any of them very well. Uh, I got to know one well, who's on, was an ASX CEO, but I discovered after time that he wasn't so much good at running a company as selling a vision of himself. So it, I'd, I'd met this bloke many, many times, thought I knew him, used to have breakfast with him, but I I think he was just good at selling himself. I, I like I like what Warren Buffett does. Um Berkshire Hathaway's got a lot of subsidiaries. This is tough for a, a small investor, like small investors like we are. But Warren Buffett likes to buy companies and incorporate them within Berkshire Hathaway, companies that have been started by their founders. Usually good CEOs are people who started the business. They're passionate about the business. They've built it up. They understand the business. And when he buys a company, the last thing he wants is for the CEO to go. He wants them to stay on. I mean, a classic example, uh, you may have heard a company called uh, Nebraska Furniture Mart. It's one of Berkshire's subsidiaries. And you say, well, furniture company, it's got a turnover of over a billion a year, so it's pretty big. Uh, I've, it was founded by a Russian immigrant to the United States just mm. before the Second World War. And it, a woman called Rose Blumpkin, I've met a grandson uh, in Omaha, hmm. lovely bloke, uh, and I've been to Nebraska Furniture Mart. It is huge. It is like another city. Anyway, Rose Bumpkin built this up from scratch and sold it. To, she started selling furniture, I think, from her living room, uh, and she sold the company, 90% of the company, to Buffett when she was 90 years old. And except for a short stint, she kept working there till she was 104. Hmm. <laughs> So Buffett loves managers who have built and lived and breathed a business. You don't always get that opportunity with an ASX listed company. So what, what can you do as an investor, as a, as a person who's just sitting at home trying to assess a CEO? Well, you could look at other companies in that sector and see which has got the, for example, the best metric, maybe best return on equity. Why is that? CEO delivering or eking out a better return on equity from his company than other companies in that sector. Now, there are lots and lots of reasons why CEOs can be good or bad, and they may not be the only factor that is making that company a great company. You know, if a footy team's losing, they always like to blame the coach, but there's lots of other reasons. There might be really bad players in the team. So you could compare companies within a sector and assume that the CEO is the difference? It's a really tough question. Mm. Yeah, so many tells that go the wrong way, mm. signals and what have you. Um, maybe we'll jump to a, a different interaction that you had then. So a lot of people that listen to this program uh, will have read the Barefoot Investor book, Scott Pape, um, or been a member of Barefoot Blueprint. Um, which you worked on for a very long time. Uh, I'm curious, or we're curious, how did you first come across Scott and become involved in the Barefoot community? Yeah, it all started with an email from him that landed in my inbox. Uh, I had just written a book, my first book, called Creating Real Wealth. It was published in uh, 2010. So I got to know... Uh, Janine Murdoch through my first book and apparently unbeknownst to me Scott Pape also knew, knew Janine and asked her if she knew someone who could work with him as uh, as an investment analyst and Janine threw my name up amongst others hmm. and I got a my first contact with Scott is I got a email uh, in my inbox and it said, hi, I'm Scott Pape. You may not know who I am. They call me the Bear and Foot Investor. I'd like to have a coffee with you. So I thought, yeah, why not? 
you know, I always like meeting people and talking about finance. So that's how it started. And I went and worked with him for nine years. And he's a great bloke, personal friend. I you can't say enough nice things about Scott. What was the highlight for you during that experience? Because you got to be involved in the lives of a lot of Australians in a way. Yeah, yeah, it was great interacting with people. You really developed an understanding of how people think about investing because I'd been working in a vacuum mm. in my own bubble, but really interacting with people and getting feedback from people, it really made me better understand what goes on in the head of people's invest investing minds. But the highlight was definitely Scott and I, five times we travelled to Omaha, uh, Nebraska for the Berkshire Hathaway AGM and on three of those occasions uh, I got involved with a lead up event to that with Bob Miles he's an author who's written about Buffett he runs a course over there and a, also a conference uh, a investing conference where people come from because they've come from all around the world to go to the Berkshire Hathaway AGM they normally have about 40,000 people lobbying on on Omaha that weekend. And a lot of these people from all around the world, investment managers, fund managers, and they hold a conference, three-day conference. So going to that was a highlight. Mm. I got to speak at one of them. Bob Miles asked me to speak. So that, that was great. Mm. It was really – some of the people I met, you know, was, was, was really, really good. Enjoyed it. I want to follow up and lace these two previous questions together, which is that um, – we we spend a lot of time here talking about financial independence and what that means, but a lot of the times we spend it on the the build up to financial independence, to reaching a point in your life where you yeah. where you get to that control, basically, of your time and your effort, whatever. Um, and so when Scott sent you that email, now we don't know circumstances and all that sort of stuff aside. But I would assume, just from what I know, that you were in a position where you didn't have to take that yeah, no, that job. No. And so I guess someone who was perhaps financially independent at that time, yep. why did you decide to do that? Like, What purpose did you have in that? Okay. It's, it's a great question. And really, oh, and I'm in a very, very fortunate stage of my life, have been for a long time, where I can say no. I don't have to do anything, really, to be quite honest. So it's all about choice. Mm. And I interacted with Scott because I wanted to. You know, it was <sighs> – payment was not an issue. Mm. You know, it, just, it was never about money. It was always about spending my time each day doing things I genuinely wanted to do. Mm. And there was not – you know, one there wasn't even one percent of the time I didn't enjoy working with him, mm. and I could have walked out any time, and he knew that. But he was—I was there because I wanted to be, and, and I'm here today because I, I was going to say the same thing today. Same thing, yeah. So what what drove you to come here today and talk? Other than so you've got the book, which no doubt many of our listeners are going to grab from Big W, maybe even hand to their friends and family. But what drives you today? Very very simple. Um, the alternative to getting involved in something you're passionate about is to do nothing. Because I certainly, long time since I've had to work for money. So you fill your day doing things you want to do. Mm. And there is nothing I would rather do than write a book about finance, interact with people about finance, help people with finance, or be talking to you. There's nothing I'd rather be doing, full stop. Mm. So that's simple. I'd be interested to know, because we don't often speak to people who are already financially independent on the show, has it changed your life in any other ways? Hmm. I had a career. I was a career type person. And when I was in my 30s and 40s, my career, you just naturally accept that you do a career. You, I wasn't really in the position I am now. But my brother died at the age of 48. I was 43 at the time and it changed my whole perspective on life because I decided that every day after the age of 48, I wanted to live the sort of life I live now. So my perspective changed from when I was working 12-hour days 
to, I started to read a lot of philosophy and one uh, philosopher that really changed my thinking was a philosopher called Epicurus and he, he believed that there were three things that you needed to do with a life that were important. Um, I've, I've called them in my book, Friends, Family and Freedom. Because I think if you can get yourself in a position where you spend time with friends, you can't be unhappy when you're with friends. In fact, Epicurus built a big house out of Athens. He was an Athenian. And he invited all his friends to come and live with him because he didn't see them as freeloaders. I, I have a, a big holiday house. On, there's an open door philosophy with all my friends. Um, so friends, family. Spend time with your family. Embrace your family. Help your family. Say, I, I can help my... I think, I think you should help your family the best way you can. So you look upon what skills you have as a person. They needn't be financial skills. They might be other skills. My wife is extremely skilled with her family. Um, I can help my kids financially, but that's important to me. It's not giving them stuff or making them weak. Um, and freedom, freedom for choice, freedom to do as you want. It's never – financial independence to me is not about things. It's not about a big yacht or driving a Lamborghini. It, it's about being able to do the important things in life without hindrance and not feeling that you are going to work because you have to pay a mortgage. Financial independence to me is not having a mortgage. Um, it's not craving for something bigger or better than I've already got. I'm very, very happy with what I've got. So that's what financially, and I didn't really reach that realization sadly until my brother died. So I was in my forties. Yeah. Can I ask from in that that period where from forty three to forty eight, what did you do differently, if anything, to prepare for that moment in your life at forty eight? So did you? You know, scrimp and save? Did you continue to work the same 10-hour days but just cut excess in your life to save more and be prepared for that time? Or No, for me it was steady as it goes. But I, to see, I had worked out that sort of by that time I'd be fine. So yep. I just cruised the last five years. I didn't cruise. I worked very, very hard. I, I was working 12, 13-hour days. Yep. Um, in not necessarily enjoying it. So, mm. yeah, everyone's different. Everyone has a different journey. But I think the ultimate destination should be friends, family, and freedom. Mm. Mm. I like that you've worked out what's enough for you because often we don't find that point and it can make us quite miserable along the way. Absolutely, in our society. One of the wealthiest nations in the world and there is so many people screaming out for more. It's, it's bizarre. Absolutely bizarre. Mm. Uh, it's because uh, I think it was John Stuart Mill who said, we do not desire to be rich, we desire to be richer than the other man. And uh, I think we need to take a much broader look at where we are placed on this planet. You know, there are billions of people here and there's only 26 million people in Australia. We, we judge ourselves by Australian standards that if we haven't got this or that or this or that, we're unhappy. Just... Travel, have a look, have a, and don't go to America and Switzerland and the UK. Go to some other places and see how other people live. We are so blessed in this country. Mm. We really are. But we spend too t much time worrying about what we don't have. I, I kicked that habit years ago. I used to suffer from that, but I don't anymore. Mm. Do you do anything in your daily routine, like a ritual or anything, to practice gratitude or... Um, something along those lines. I stop and I pause and I look. For example, um, if I'm walking along the beach, I make it a really slow walk and I stop and I watch people surfing and I'll watch the waves and I'll listen and I'll feel, I'll look at birds. When my daughter comes with her new baby, I will just go out and stand in awe, awe you know. It's, it's admiring and looking at things rather than rushing past them, mm. I think. Mm. 
Do you read any books along the lines of, we'll ask you for a list of books in just a moment, but do you read any books along the lines of more like the spiritual side of things or things like, say, like The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle or anything like that? I don't. I'm not a spiritual person. However, I don't deny the the comfort that spirituality and religion brings to people. But I'm not a religious or spiritual person. I guess I'm too much of a scientist for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you do love to read, as anyone that reads the Ulysses contract will discover. And I know we tasked you with bringing along some of your favourite investing books, and I know you've yeah. got a piece of paper with a few lined up for us. So I'd love yeah, to I hear. didn't want to miss any. Look, I've, I've got I've got about seven hundred books in my bookshelf, and the bookshelf's not there for show. I've pretty much read every one of them, and <laughs> uh, some of them I've read more than once. I must admit, because you do tend to forget over the years. So it's a really, really difficult question to say which are my favourites. For example, uh, financial history. You have there's so many books you have to read to compile a picture. So there is no one single book. Mm. Um, I think Devil Take the Hindmost by Edward Chancellor is a good one of financial crashes, but there are others as well. But if I was pushed to choose one, that's that's quite good. Edward Chancellor is a good writer and obviously a great historian. He's he's an Englishman. Um, psychology. So that was the history one. I guess psychology um, and behavioural finance. Daniel Kahneman has been great in behavioural finance, and it's it's a bit of a mindful thinking fast and slow, but but it covers a lot of ground. But there are many good books on behavioural finance, but Danny, anything with Danny Kahneman or Amos Tversky, unfortunately Amos has been dead for a long time. He was his partner in crime. Um, the Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel has, has done very, very well and for good reason. It's a good book. It sort of digs into all our human frailties. Mm -hmm. And I think if you become conscious of your human frailties, I would hope that you're less likely to 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 uh, to fall prey to them. Let, let me say, and I guess we didn't touch on this, the Ulysses contract, we've talked about the sirens. What we haven't, what I haven't mentioned uh, is how to avoid them, mm. which, is, which is what Ulysses did by being tied to the mast. It boils down to our personal psychology. Some people just aren't made out, sorry, aren't cut to be share investors. If you think the world has ended because the market's fallen by 50%, then maybe you should think again because it's going to happen to you again and again in an investing lifetime. You've got, you've, got to, you've got to flip things. You've got to think of a market crash not as the end of the world but an opportunity to be buying <laughs> stocks cheaply. Mm. So that's the way I do it. I, I, I've, I have a philosophical approach to money, so you've probably picked that up. I mean, you could... You could shave a lot of money out of my bank account and I wouldn't really lose sleep over it because it's not going to change my life. But I I know some people fret if the stock market falls 2%. You know, they get upset about it. You've got to kill that. So how can you kill it? Well, by developing an understanding of financial history, you'll begin to understand that volatility is perfectly normal in the stock market. And if it still doesn't sell you on the idea, uh, perhaps tying yourself to the mask means buying index funds, broad-based ETFs, and not watching the market because you're going to be absolutely fine if you hold them long term. Uh, and if you even think that's a worry, then perhaps go and buy real estate. So that's, <laughs> that, you know, that's behavioural finance. Um, I was talking before about the siren song of uh, of forecasters. Mm. Uh, Dan Gardner's book Future Babel is really good. If you, if, it's quite a good read. And if you get to the end of Future Babel and still listen to forecasters on TV, there's something wrong with you because he, he produces an extremely convincing argument. While well, it's all a waste of time, and I think for a good general overview of the market, uh, Howard Marks. The most important thing. I, I thought that had some really useful information in it. So that that's just how many? That's just five books. You know, I could sit here all day, but I won't. Mm. 
Now, we'll put a link in the show notes to all of those books that you just mentioned, as, as well as Ulysses' contract, of course. Um, and once again, you can pick it up from any good bookstore, and every good bookstore uh, should stock it. Yeah. And Michael, we've covered a lot of ground today from the sirens and how we might be led astray as investors and how we can be our own worst enemy. Some of your journey investing and learning about different companies and ideas and what financial independence means for you. But if you had to leave listeners with one lesson or piece of advice or idea after listening to today's episode, what would that be? People confuse what's important to become a good investor. They think it's an intellectual exercise. It can be if you want it to be, but it doesn't have to be. And I think the most important thing for a good investor is is certain personal traits. Uh, those traits of discipline, uh, those traits of consistency and patience. And I think if you're disciplined, consistent and patient and follow a certain rules, you can become a good investor. And by that, I mean disciplined, consistent and patient. What I mean is constantly saving something, constantly investing something and be patient to allow compounding of returns to deliver the return. I, I, I've talked a bit about going to Omaha and um, I've talked also about Joseph de la Vega's book, uh, Confusion of Deconfusion, de de the first book I am aware of that was written on investing, 1688. Patience appears in his book. De la Vega says what's important to be a great investor is patience. I have many, many old books in my bookshelves going back, you know, 150 up to 200 years. That word patience appears again and again and again. And I had the good fortune of meeting Warren Buffett's daughter, Susie Buffett, on three occasions, once to actually speak to her. And in the small group I was in, someone asked her um, what two words best describe your father. And she didn't hesitate. She said integrity and patience. And I think the message I want to pass on to people is Impatience is the enemy to be a good investor. Mm. Well, that's a wonderful way to end the discussion. I really appreciate, once again, you taking the time to join Kate and I in the RAS community listening to this or watching this. Um, you didn't have to be here today, as we've discussed, <laughs> but we do really, really appreciate your time. That's Lisa. okay. Thanks I'll, for coming. I'm to talk to you. Yeah. And Kate, as always, thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs>